morning. Oh, come on, really. I mean, we had snacks, sugar, coffee. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Yeah. Got to shout it out. While I'm uh, going into the intro and everything here and getting ready to pray, you can turn to John chapter 1. Not exactly where one would expect to go for Easter. Who did what? Oh, yeah, and just a reminder for those of you that are visiting, if you would, please make sure you fill out a visitor's card today. Um, uh, we don't put you on a list. We don't email you and remind you to give or anything like that. That's not what we do. Um, mainly, it's one of the things we do is we pray over the visitors that come in, and if there's anything you want information on, you put it on that card, and we'll get back in touch with you. Um, other than that, most of it can be found at the website. Man, I hope I don't kick these flowers over. I've got such a habit of putting my feet up on everything. So, uh, But for right now, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, just uh, amazed. Father, we are blown away by your grace. We are blown away by, Lord, when, when our flesh, when our eyes, when our, our, very, our, our very heart seems to betray us and take us away from you, you bring us back. Lord, for those that are coming here for the first time today that may not know you, who are interested, Lord, who want to know, I pray that you would move upon their spirits right now, that your Holy Spirit would begin to minister even as we, Lord, begin to look at your word and have conversations and, and, and just to see what it is that you have to say to us um, about this amazing person called Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. And it's in that name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Um, so... You should be in John chapter 1, verse 1 right now. Don't start reading yet. We're, we're not quite there, uh, as is customary. I know. It's like, look at your Bible, but we're not going to read it, right? Uh, no, but it's, there's so many adaptations and ideas of who Jesus is today. You know, like every single, you can't turn on the TV, especially around Easter and Christmas. You can't turn on the TV without CNN, I mean CNN, trying to tell you who Jesus is, right? You know, and it's like the History Channel, which often doesn't even know what history is, is trying to tell you who Jesus is. So, and, and the thing is, with everything that Jesus talks about, you know, when, he, when we talk about heaven, hell, eternal life, eternal punishment, if all that, even for a moment, is real, then who Jesus is is incredibly important, is it not? Because if everything hangs on him or what he says then, man, if you've got it wrong, that's a huge consequence, isn't it? So what we're going to do is I just want to take a moment and uh, look at some fake Jesuses, right? Um, we're we're going to get there in just a second, but because most of us, we come to this, and a lot of us have a Jesus in our mind or who we think Jesus is. Um, like, I can say eternal damnation, and some people will go, well, my Jesus would never damn you know, anybody to hell. Because that's biblical. It says, you know, they will be damned. And, and you and I would go, Jesus would never do that. But, you know, here's the thing. In, in Genesis chapter 2, God breathed his life into Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And, and when he did, what did mankind do when he, God gave him this beautiful place? He broke it, right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, the Lord God took man put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And in Genesis chapter 3, they did and they did. You know, uh, they died spiritually, then they died physically. And here's the thing, you and I, we look at sin and we go, ah, it's nothing, ah, it's not a big deal. Ah, oh, they ate a piece of fruit dude, and broke the universe. You get me? You and I kind of poo-poo sin and kind of, ah, it's not a big deal. But God, all he said was, don't eat this. And instead of believing him, they believed the devil and they ate. That's huge, man. And that has huge implications for us. Now you can put that up. So, you know, so as we look and we look at this, you know, we want to see the comparisons of Jesus because there's so many to choose from, right? This is actually done by a gentleman named Adam Ford. Uh, you may have seen him on Facebook and the Internet. He's also, uh, also called Adam 4D, right? Uh, so, you know, which Jesus do you worship? There are so many to choose from. Go to the next one. 
the John Lennon Jesus. All you need is love, right? That's all I care about, really, not truth or anything like that. It's all about peace, love, and, and peace, you know, and spirituality, being real spiritual, right? But yet doing whatever you want to do. Let's go to the next slide. Zig Ziglar Jesus, right? I created you to succeed. You're supposed to be succeeding. You're supposed to win at life, right? You should change your name to Winnie Winterton, right? Uh, success is in your future. Believe it and achieve it. I got your back, champ. That's Jesus, right? That's a, for Jesus, that's who Jesus is for a lot of people. He's just here to make sure I can get it done. Go to the next one. Mr. Rogers, Jesus. And for those of you who said don't diss on Mr. Rogers, I'm not, Okay. But he says, what I'm most concerned with, dear children, is that you be really nice to each other. Everybody should just be nice. Never hurt anyone's feelings because you are people just like you are, my special little flowers. Right? Go to the next one before everybody hurts me. Right? The cool dad Jesus. Right? Because right now in our modern times, every, all the dads want to be the cool dad. I'm more of a buddy than a dad. Right? Hey, I'm technically in charge here. But hey, I'm no buzzkill. Do whatever you want. I'm not going to punish you. I'm no lame. Psh, I didn't see anything. LOL. Right? Okay? Isn't that funny when like a 60-year-old dude goes LOL? Yeah? I know. My kids make fun of me. But, hey, but I'm better at them than messing with computers. So I got one up. Rob Bell, Jesus. Some of you know who he is. Some of you don't. I'm not going to explain that. But he says everyone's going to be just fine. Everyone goes to heaven when they die. Any of the view of, of me is just toxic. If hell were real, that would make me a monster, wouldn't it? Yeah, a toxic monster. I'm, I'm not a toxic monster, Jesus. I would never do that to anybody. Right? Go to the next one. Richard Simmons, Jesus. Everybody remember Richard Simmons? Right? You're doing a great job. You can do it. I believe in you. You're beautiful. You're strong. You're perfect. Right? No, 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 no. Is there another one? Yeah. Bernie Sanders, Jesus. I expect you to love your neighbor. I expect you to do that by supporting all government welfare programs, universal health care, high taxes on the rich, higher minimum wage, and more environmental regulations. Because Jesus would want that, right? No, go to the next one. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, Jesus. Okay, we've got to hit the other side of the camp, right? What I care about most, Jesus says, is physical conservatism, smaller government, and your unalienable right given by me to bear any firearm in your person anytime, anywhere. I know, I'm hitting some sore spots there, right? <laughs> yeah. That, okay, Genie Jesus. Everybody remember, right? You ain't never had a friend like me, right? I, I'd just be chilling in heaven till you need something, right? And then just say the magic word, in Jesus' name, and kazam, your wish is my command. You ain't never had a friend like me. No, 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 that's not Jesus either. Go ahead. Here's the thing. All of these versions of Jesus do have two important things in common. There are actually people that believe in them. That's a scary thing. And they don't exist. They're figments of people's imaginations. Right? And, they, and here these people have given the name Jesus to this, but there's only one Jesus. I think there's one more slide, right? These guys, none of them, the karma Jesus, sports Jesus, vegan Jesus, career Jesus, racist Jesus, or butler Jesus, None of these are Jesus. Okay, you can take those off. As we come into this, as you and I begin to look at who Jesus is, that's who we want to see today. Because none of those versions can save us, guys. If I depend on anything like that, Jesus isn't going to say, hey, I'm grading on a curve, bro, you're okay. He's not going to do that. He's going to say, I plainly told you who I was. You didn't like who I was. And so you tried to go somewhere else for it. He's not the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses either, who teach that Jesus is a created angelic being inferior to God the Father. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was just a physical manifestation of Michael the Archangel. That's what they believe and teach. And there are strong biblical grounds to deny that, but here's the thing, they also believe that Jesus did not rise from the dead. They actually teach and state in their doctrine that the man Jesus is dead, forever dead. That there was no bodily, physical resurrection. Is that right? Is the Jesus of the Mormons the real Jesus? This is where it hits a little closer to home. Many of us probably have friends that are Mormons and are really nice people. Most of us would look at them and say, 
I like them better than most of the Christians I know, right? Mormon teaching says that Jesus was one of the many sons who were procreated in heaven by Elohim and one of his many unnamed wives. These sons, according to the Mormon church, include Lucifer himself. So they teach that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. Not just that. Here's one of the things that the, the, the Mormon church teaches. This is from their website. On first hearing, the doctrine that Lucifer and our Lord Jesus Christ are brothers may seem surprising to some, especially to those unacquainted with latter-day revelations. But both the scriptures and prophets, notice they had to add prophets, affirm that Jesus Christ and Lucifer, and they treat Jesus Christ like it's his last name, right? And Lucifer are indeed offspring of our Heavenly Father and therefore spirit brothers. Jesus was Lucifer's older brother. At least they made him older, right? But here's the thing. The Mormon church also denies the biblical account of the virgin birth. It teaches instead that the human body given to Jesus at his birth was the product of physical relations between God the Father who visited earth and had relations with Mary who was his spirit daughter in heaven. You're talking about sick. That's sick. So what is, you know, again, what's the big deal, right? As long as they believe in Jesus, it's just okay, right? Wrong, man. Sin, bro, remember that? We covered that when we started. If you believe in the wrong dude, you're believing in the wrong dude. You can't just make this up. Because we come into this, and because of Adam, because of these things, we've got to remember that you and I, just like them, because he said you do this and you're dead, spiritually first. If there's anybody in here that hasn't sinned, raise your hand right now, and you can just go, because you're good. All right, everybody's sinned. Good, okay. All right, so we're all in the same camp, which means if you and I have sinned, we are dead, and we're all sons of Adam, as it were. We're all related to him. You and I were, you know, long distant cousins, as it were. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. And since all of us have sinned, all of us have died. And even if we didn't, we got it from Adam. And John 1.8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So some of you may say, oh, I'm really a good person. And Jesus, he looks at you and goes, oh, really? Well, let's compare, right? And it never measures up. We can be good people, but we're still sinners. There will be a lot of good people in hell. Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, and don't worry, we are going to get to John 1. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ himself says this. And then he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. To know who Jesus is, is to know God. If you don't know who Jesus is, you don't know God. Period. You may have your own version of him, but worship who you will. There is only one real deal. And that's a big deal, isn't it? Because... If he says that he himself is the way, he doesn't say my teachings are the way. He doesn't say if you're just really good to everybody and love everybody like God does, you're okay. He doesn't do that. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He himself is it. And it's also a big deal because if it is impossible, if no one can do this without him, then it's a huge deal to know who Jesus is. And the big deal is, is you've got to know that Lord thing, which is our, our kind of our who is Lord. Because there's so many versions of Lord. And do you actually have the right Lord? In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. So there's that word. There's that important word. That we hear because how can I confess somebody is Lord, right? And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness with the mouth. Confession is made into salvation for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. 
And that's where we, as believers, as, as, as followers of Christ, get that who is Lord idea, right? Are you claiming him as Lord? And, you know, it doesn't mean like, you know, it, it, it's, it, 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 it means something more than just, you know, the big kahuna or whatever it is, right? It's an idea of Lord, Master, Ruler, King, you know? My leader, it's a, the word is kurios in the Greek, and, and it means to have power or authority. It means you know what you're talking about. It means if, if somebody that has this authority, if somebody says A, then because of who he is, because of the very nature of who he is, I need to believe A. Because if I don't, then I'm not right. Because he is Lord, he can back up every word that comes out of him. He is the authority on heaven. And we saw that in the video at the beginning. Why? Because he came from there. Jesus came from heaven. John 6, 38 says, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So John came from, you know, Jesus came from heaven to do God's will. And we would expect that someone that comes and talks about eternal life, that's why when I come and talk to you about it, I don't talk to you like I know it. I, I get it from here. Because he knew it, and he wrote it, and he gave it to us. And if somebody comes and says something that says my eternal life hinges on it, then I want to make sure it's right. Because that's a big deal. It's not like I'm just looking at history or looking at something that somebody said because I want to pass a grade in school. This is eternity. I blow this one. I blow this one. And that's a hu another huge deal that Jesus came from heaven. The only reason that I wouldn't believe in him is because I don't believe he was from heaven. Because I don't believe he was right. But I can't really be a Christian if I don't call him Lord. So now let's look at Jesus being Lord and what that means to us. Finally, we're getting to John chapter 1, right? Now, it's, and we're not going to do anywhere near an exhaustive look at the deity of Jesus Christ or, you know, those do particular doctrines. We're just examining this so you and I can be assured of what we believe. Jesus has proved Lord because of that crazy thing called the resurrection. Um, you know, that nutty idea that Christians believe that a dead man came back to life when it first happened, we're going to see that 500 people have seen him rise from the dead and, and then went and told everybody. Because how could you not tell everybody that? But let's look at this Lord. In the beginning, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Wow. That's huge. There's no other teacher. There's no other philosopher. There's no other person that would claim something like this. And I would say somebody that existed previously, consciously, knowingly, and would be called God would kind of qualify as a Lord, wouldn't you say? You know? We read, when you read this, you read that there is another person called God. You and I, we hear it, we don't quite understand it. That's that doctrine of the Trinity you hear Christians always talking about, or we as Christians talk about. You know, and, and we're not going to explain that one in depth or detail today either, but the fact is, is God is God, and everything we read about Him and His Bible says He is one. So Jesus is God, which is why he is called the Son of God. Hello, right? You know, we, we don't call him the Son of God simply because it's a cool, honorific title. We call him that because that's who he is. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Therefore, we know Jesus was not created. He was not a, a created being. He created all things. If it was created, he made it. He said, It says it right there. And you're going to say, well, no, it says the word made it. And we'll get to that in a moment. All things. What does all mean? Right on. Okay, all means all, and that's all all means, right? Okay? All right, so this guy, or this word that we're reading about here, wasn't created. Now look at verse 14. 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. Full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. Who would that be? That would be Jesus. He became Flesh. Another way of putting this is the word existed in the flesh. Jesus didn't change from being a God to being a man. God existed into humanity. And it's, it's insane. We begin to think about it and we think, ah, it's like mythology. It's like those things. No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. This is something completely different. And we know from the other Gospels, he didn't transform from one to another. He was born. He took on the role of human from start to finish, just like us. His conception was miraculous. It was spiritual. You know, it wasn't some creepy Zeus-like God that comes down and, you know, hey girl, what's up, right? It wasn't anything like that. It was an angel that came and said, you, you, you're going to bear the living word. It's amazing, man. He was born just like you and me. And and you listen to different stories and you listen to different commentators and where he was born, it could have been anywhere from a street to an alley to a cave with animals put into a manger, a feeding trough. That's pretty humble. Most gods, most kings aren't born like that. He lived an incredibly humble life. You know, we know from the word that he had at least seven brothers and sisters. And they were so poor that when they went to make, you know, when they would go make sacrifices at the temple, they could only afford what was done for poor people, which was usually in the price of about two cents for for their sacrifices. That's all they could afford. So Jesus, in our time, probably would have lived in the trailer park. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I'm trailer park, so I can say that, okay? That's right, man. All right? And here's the thing. He lived this incredibly humble life, and for 30 years, when he finally goes to get baptized, and his father looks at him because he's been working for his family. He's been doing these things. And God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You and I think that we've got to do all kinds of ministries and all these other things. Man, you could just be a good dad or a good husband or a good brother or sister. And God will say, man, that's ministry. I am well pleased. But yet Jesus, he he takes on this ministry. And for three years, he showed us what God looks like here on earth. And then he died on a cross for us. He took our sins upon himself. And we see an amazing thing about this Lord that he came to save us, all of us. It says in John chapter 1, look at verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of the man, but of God. And sometimes we can read those things and we go, ah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But here's the thing, it's very simple. Receive him. That's it. You know, who he is, what he offers, you know, the the fact that he wants to save you. To save his creation. We're going to read later in John 3, 17, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We have to understand that this condemnation that the world often feels when we present Jesus and we say eternal death, you know, eternal life, and we present Jesus, the condemnation the world feels is because they reject him. I don't like that version of Jesus. Give me another one. Right? You got anything else back there? It's comparative to me if you were to take something like, let's say all of you had cancer. You know, I'm not saying you do. And if you do, I love you and I I do pray for you. But I'm using that because that's the one most of us are familiar with. But if everybody had cancer and I had this drug, and I said this drug will cure your cancer, but you can never eat bacon again. Yeah, I know. That's big, right? That's huge. Okay, but and I, and I know it's a weird comparison, but here's the thing. If I said if you did this, you know, but you'll be cured. You'll never have to worry about ever having it again. And you would say, mm, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to give up bacon. Right? 
And I know, you know, and I'm not being flippant. I, I want you to understand. Because people will hear and they'll hear, Jesus Christ came to save me, that's great. Oh, he actually wants me to just give myself to him and I lose everything and I got to just, I got to call him Lord? Well, can I just call him Lord and not actually do it? No? Uh, hmm, yeah, let me, let me think about that. I got at least 30 years, right? You only have right now promised to you. And here's the thing, man. He does not reject you. You reject him when you choose to live your life your own way. When you choose to live in your sin rather than live in him, you reject Jesus Christ. You play the role of Adam and you say, I believe the devil because he's a lot more fun. We read things like John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Demons believe and tremble, guys. Belief is relying on and trusting in Him. And belief is something that carries out in how you live. How you live does not mean you will save yourself by how you live. That's not how it works. In John chapter 3, when he says this, he's talking to a dude that lives a practically sinless life that we would look at and go, that's one righteous dude, right? But Jesus looks at this guy who is nearly perfect and says, you must be born again. You ain't there, bro, right? Because this life is not all there is. This world, you know, it has so much to offer, we say, but does it compare with eternity? You and I are going to enter into another realm of creation. Just like when we were kids, we became adults. Well, we grew up. Not all of us became adults, right? Okay? Let's just say I got older and, and wider. Okay? That's pretty much it. Um, but if you look at the evidence and everything that we have for God and everything we see and everything He says... This life is not all there is. And most people know the story of Jesus, just as we do it. An itinerant Jewish preacher, right? Came and preached the love and kingdom of heaven stuff. Riled up religious leaders. Got killed with the cross. Christians started worshiping him. But that's not the story. That's not the real deal. That's not what really happened. Um, there's a very old Christian saying that was actually written by Paul um, some think even less than a decade after it happened. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 3. And this is Paul. And this is a guy who hated Jesus. He hated Christianity. He hated it so much that he went and killed people who practiced it. But then God showed up in his life and changed him dramatically. And here's what Paul said. He said, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried. So He died. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And after that, He was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve. He's talked to these people. He's heard from them that Jesus is alive. I saw Him face to face. I ate breakfast with Him, bro. Seriously. And the twelve said, yeah, we were there. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to, per, to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Over 500 people. That's, that's not mass hysteria. If it were mass hysteria, as some people have claimed, then that's a big miracle too. Because that many people don't see the same thing at the same time. It just doesn't happen. And even then, this happened over the space of days and weeks. For many of them, they saw Jesus multiple times, which you would have thought if they'd have seen him more than once, they would have said, you know, there's something off about you. But instead, every single time, it was confirmed over and over and over again. And now note, as we read this, he was dead. He died, you and I know, as he said in the Scriptures, as he said in John 3, as we read earlier, he died to cover our sins. But one of the things we haven't read yet is that he rose from the dead to give us life. And it was that life that was lost in the beginning. Remember how I said at the beginning that when Adam and Eve were created, God breathed his life into them. And he did all this. He died 
on the cross to cover our sins, and then he rose again from the dead to breathe his life into us again, that you and I could live again. We saw it in the beginning with Adam and Eve, and now he's doing it again, but in a completely different way. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, When we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Isn't that crazy? God died for the ungodly. That's me, man. I was ungodly. Still am sometimes. In here. It's a struggle. Verse 7 of Romans 5 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We read that and we go, okay, that's a lot of words, man. Okay, but here's the basic thing. He died so that he could make peace between God and us again. And that's a permanent thing. He did it once for all. It's one of those things when we talk to people, how many of your sins were in the future when Jesus Christ died? All of them, right? You know, he died once and for all. Backwards and forwards, it doesn't matter. He died. And he made peace between you and God with that. All right, so now there's peace, but you're still dead. Because I still sinned, and I was born in sin, and I'm still dead. What do I need? I need life. I need to be alive. And that's where he says that him being alive, you shall be saved by his life. That's salvation. The cross is that which covers our sin. His breath of life, His Holy Spirit coming to live within us is what saves us. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He, Him, very, him His very self is the life. We are saved by His life. Why? Because He comes to dwell in us. That's that Holy Spirit. And I know it sounds weird. You hear it and you go, what do you mean? I mean, if you just have a religious faith, if you just have a faith confession, if you just say, I am a Christian, it will not save you. You must be born again. You must be born again. And to be born again is to receive his spirit into you. As many, he said, we read in John 1, as received him. He gave the right to become sons of God. Because he's in you, you're in him. And it comes through faith, by trusting, by relying on Him. We have read in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess what's in your heart, that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. So I ask you right now to look into your heart. Do you know that Jesus is there? Not just do you know that Jesus is there, but would you confess Him to the world? Do you tell everybody that Jesus is there? Some of them may even look at you and wonder, what's different about you? There's something different about you. So do you tell everybody what, if you're, you know, for those of you that say you're believers, do you tell everybody what Jesus is doing in you? What Jesus is about? And if some of you wonder, or some of you would like to make that confession, if some of you struggle and just want to renew that faith, we're going to make an opportunity for you in just a moment. As a matter of fact, if you would, Close your Bibles and stand with me. And as you stand, I'm going to call the worship team up. Because I'm going to give you the opportunity right now. If you truly believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and you confess that He is Lord, which is to say He is right, that you are in, you know, I'm ungodly, I'm a sinner. And if you'd like to, for the first time today, if you'd like to come forward as we begin this song of worship, I'd like you to come forward because I want you to confess it to everybody here because if you'll confess it here, you'll confess it to the world. So as we begin this song of worship, then I'd like you to, to do that.
for the ungodly. This fact leaves the ungodly no excuse if they do not come to him and believe in him unto salvation. Had it been otherwise, they might have pleaded, we are not fit to come. But you are ungodly, and Christ died for the ungodly. Why not you? If you'd like to make a confession of faith for the first time or a recommitment, then please come forward right now as we finish this song. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life. As you go out today, 